Well, the boy rebels. He runs to Iran, marries the daughter of the Persian king. Again, remember, these are not Christian Armenians. The nobility intermarried. They spoke the same language. Many of them prayed to the same gods. I'm sure James Russell has told you there are 2,700, at least that we know of, Persian words in the modern Armenian that you speak. Arshak is a Persian name. Or the, these are all Persian names. Artashes is a Persian name. Okay? These are Persian names. Different way of selling it. Artashes is Ardashir. But it's Artashes. Okay? So they come from there. The nobility had intermarried to a great extent. Not the peasants. Not the common people. But the upper classes were very fluid. They were not thinking the way some of us think today. They're not nationalism, flags, and things like that. They were not that kind. They were noblemen who were thinking in a feudal system. And so what happens is, Tigran realizes very soon that Iran from one side and Pompeii from the other side, it's not going to work. So Tigran outsmarts the Iranians and his son. Because his son immediately wrote a letter to Pompey that when my father goes away, put me on the Armenian throne, I'll be loyal to Rome. But Tigran outsmarted all of them. He personally goes to Pompey, surrenders to Pompey. And Pompey is a great diplomat. Pompey realizes without Tigran, that corridor is not safe. Rome is far away in Italy. Iran is right there. No matter what kind of an army has Rome has to keep in Syria, has to keep in that area to make sure they can challenge the Iranians. So he basically gives the crown back to Tigran. And he gives him back the title of King of Kings, just to tell the Iranians, Armenia under Tigran is an ally of Rome. Tigran's son only gets Sophine. That's all he gets. Greater Armenia remains intact without Iberia, without Caucasian Albania, without Adiabene, Migdonia, Osrohene, Comagina. All that Rome takes. Rome takes the Middle East, Syria and Iraq today, and Palestine, and Kilikia. All that is taken by Rome. Iran remains what it was, the Parthian Empire, with some of Atropatene back to it and some of Adiabene, Greater Armenia remains intact. Tigran rules for another 10 years. He dies at age 85 in 55 BC. The Iranians get duped by the Romans. Tigran's son gets duped by the Romans. Because Rome realized you need a strong Armenia in that corridor. Unfortunately, after the death of Tigran and the death of Pompey and after the problems of Julius Caesar, etc., Mark Antony makes a big mistake. Mark Antony goes to Egypt. He sees Liz Taylor, this Cleopatra. They have an affair. They come to Armenia. Liz Taylor, I mean, Cleopatra was in Armenia. They come to Armenia together. The surviving son of Tigran, not from Cleopatra, but from another one. Okay? The surviving son, Ardavaz II, he is the one that is uh, taken by Mark Antony, put in a cage, taken to Egypt, and the Artashesian dynasty puters out. By 1 BC, this first Armenian dynasty is gone. 66 years pass, civil war, Roman governors, Iranian governors, Georgian governors are put there, Armenia is decimated. And finally, in the year 66 AD, Iran puts the brother of the Iranian king, Vagarsh, Iranian king, his brother's name was Tirdad. When he comes to Armenia, he becomes Tirdad. Tardad becomes king of Armenia on a new dynasty, the Iranian dynasty, the Arshakid, Arshakuni, Arshakid dynasty. The way this was accomplished, you would say, well, what did Rome do? How would Rome allow this? Very simple. 
after 66 years of war in that area, both get tired, they decided on the compromise. It's known as the Compromise of Randia. The body was supplied by the Iranians, the crown by Rome. Turda goes all the way to Rome, kneels in front of Emperor Nero. Nero crowns Turda. Turda comes back. For a short time, he renames Artashat Neronia in honor of Nero, just for a short time until Nero dies. And so the compromise works for a short time, though, because after that it continues. More Roman emperors come in to fight Iran. Iran fights Rome in Armenia and Iraq. Mesopotamia becomes Iraq, just Baghdad, the Ctesiphon. The area of Baghdad becomes the line, one side of it Iran, the other side of Rome, and Armenia, one side Iran, one side Rome. These wars continue throughout the Arshakuni dynasty until eventually Armenia is partitioned in the year 387. Officially partitioned. One side goes to Iran, one side in Rome with two different kings, two different administrations, and after that it dies out. And it takes another 300 years or 400 years for a new kind of a weak dynasty, the Bagratid, to rise up and that doesn't last. So the experiment of Tigran to create a strong Armenia, an Armenia not alone, but together with Pontus, Hellenistic Armenia, not Roman, but more Greek, more Greek culture, in that corridor, if it had worked, in my opinion, that's why I think Dikran was great. Dikran was the only Armenian king who immediately saw the possibilities. He realized, as long as Armenia is in this geographic position, you can't change geography. It's always going to be in this corridor. The only way to secure the corridor is to have a strong army, enough allies, to be able to play both Rome and later on Eastern Roman Empire, Byzantine Empire, etc., and Iran. He did it for a short time. And it worked for a short time. It's the stupidity of Rome and the stupidity of Iran, but mainly Rome, because Rome was in the West, to destroy this corridor. First Rome, then the Byzantine Empire. Once we became Christian, the Byzantines didn't like our church. They wanted us to follow the Greek church. And they attacked and they attacked Armenian and they tried to make Armenians accept the Greek church constantly, all the way until the fall of the Bagratid. By destroying the Armenian corridors, first the Arabs coming from the south, and of course, and by destroying Syria, the Roman Syria or independent Syria, Arabs from the south and later the Turks from the east. And who paid the, besides the Armenians? A big price was paid by the Europeans, by the Italians, by the Romans, by the Byzantines. The Turks took over Constantinople, they took over all over Eastern Europe, they enslaved the entire Christian population for at least 800 years. And we're still paying the price in Kosovo, in Bosnia, in all the stuff, that, and now they want to become part of the European Union with American help, because we want them to become part of the European Union.